Good evening. This is Loretta McGraw. I'm the Region 7 Coordinator for the Society of Professional Journalists. Tonight we are talking about Midwest Banned Books. This is going to be a free webinar for our SPJ members it's talking about some of the legislation affecting the Midwest. And of course, we have a lot of ongoing legislation, both here in Region 7 and around the country, especially attacking our First Amendment. And those banned books are particularly affected in states such as Iowa and Missouri. So tonight I am joined by two associate professors from their prospective universities to kind of talk to us about what is going on in their prospective regions and what we as journalists and citizens can kind of do about these banned books and the legislation that's going on right now. So a uh, little bit of background. I'm going to go ahead and let Brett and Jared take the floor to tell the, the, tell the audience about themselves. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Brett Johnson. I'm a visiting associate professor at the University of Iowa School of Journalism. Um, I'm formerly of the University of Missouri, um, uh, at the J School there, um, but I've been teaching uh, media law um, for, um, oh my gosh, like eight years now. Um, and I'm a native of Iowa, grew up in Iowa City. Um, uh, had some great experiences reading books and public school libraries uh, that I'm happy to talk about um, to inform stuff today. So yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Jared Schroeder. Um, I'm associate professor of journal journalism studies here at University of Missouri School of Journalism. Um, I teach communication law classes to graduate students and undergraduate students. I'm actually finishing, I just counted today, my 31st career section of uh, undergraduate communication laws. I've done it 31 times now. And every time's different. It's fun every single time for different reasons. Um, so yeah, uh, that's my introduction. Wonderful. Well, thank you both Brett and Jared so much for joining us. Um, of course, uh, we know those who are familiar with the Midwest know particularly that those um, states, Missouri and Iowa are having a lot of legislation that has already gone into effect or that is very soon to go into effect regarding those banned books. And um, Iowa particularly has a Senate file 496 that is about to go into effect January 1st. So just less than a month away, we'll be having a lot of legislation affecting both our libraries and our public school systems and in the state of Missouri, there are a lot of legislation already ongoing. Um, however, that legislation is a little bit vague for the most part, leaving a lot of individuals and educators at risk. So here joining us again are Brett and Jared to talk to us a little bit about that and their experience um, in the teaching world and sector and how that kind of relates to them or what they're seeing in, in results to this. So I just wanted to first off ask because we have those lawsuits that kind of claim that, you know, these banned books are a First Amendment violation. So uh, would you say that banned books are a First Amendment violation? Why or why not? Um, so I'd say it depends, uh, which is the 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 answer that, you know, anytime you ask a legal question, it's the answer that nobody wants, but is is really all you're really going to get. Um, I, I think what's interesting about uh, Senate File 496 and, and some of these other um, book ban laws we're seeing around the country is um, states have kind of found a soft underbelly um, when it comes to the First Amendment. Um, you have um, the issue of um, sexually explicit content uh, uh, and and the extent to which that content can be that minors can view that content. Um, the Supreme Court really hasn't given us a clear answer about what what is too explicit for minors. They've used the word obscenity as to minors, and there's a there's the Miller case that gives us the the um, the test for obscenity as to adults. But for minors, the, there's a footnote in a case that says, well, it has to be clearly erotic. Well, that doesn't help much either. So there's that issue. There's the issue of um, curriculum, uh, school boards having a lot of power when it comes to defining curriculum um, uh, that is often balanced with the First Amendment rights of, of students and teachers. Um, and uh, there's um, the issue of libraries um, and the extent to which uh, libraries, which are, are books being uh, voluntary. It's not, it's not a curriculum that's being 
um, required of students, but rather uh, a, a menu of books that students can choose from. Uh, that is also an issue that um, there's there's one major case we can probably we'll probably talk about at the Pico case, um, but but that that touches on some of the issues there. Um, but it was a, a case with a, a, a plurality opinion, um, and the facts are somewhat distinguishable from here. So, uh, again, a long answer to the short, it depends. Um, but it, Jared can probably shed a little more light on it uh, uh, as well. That was, I mean, he's very close to the, like, he and I did not compare answers before. Uh, and we came up with a very similar, it depends answer. You know, if, if the federal government or even a state government just said no one in this state or nowhere in this country can read Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eyes or can possess it, that would be unconstitutional. This is easy. It's awful. It can't be. It's clearly unconstitutional. We've got a lot of precedent to back that up. But because of some of the reasons that Brett mentioned, uh, the nature of the school environment for the school cases, the school libraries, the curriculum, uh, the connection with um, children and sexually related content, um, those are all little tools that have been used to circumvent this um, all of these are sort of content-based restrictions, but they all have a little, like, and I say that because uh, traditionally the government, the First Amendment has said the government generally cannot do content-based restrictions, right? They can't say, we don't like your ideas, you can't have them. Um, but there are exceptions and they are hitting all these little exceptions. The power of local school boards, you know, the power of uh, the, the precedents that say, you know, there are, it is allowed to limit even in sometimes indecent content sometimes from minors, uh, access to minors um, and things like that. I mean, I also think it's worth mentioning that most of these, like we mentioned, are are vague. The laws tend to be vague. And I think a lot of times they're a political, they're a, there's an effort here looking, it's like the tail is sort of wagging the dog. They're looking to accomplish something. They're not really sure what it is, but they want to do something about whatever they want to do something about. They're sure of that. And so what you've got is these laws that you know say these words like little word salads and the word salads are very big and what happens is you know we be, we expand well beyond the original well as some people have said was the original stated goal if the people say they're really concerned about students in public school libraries having access to indecent or obscene content that's a discussion we could have but tony morrison or you know you know, what Richard Wright's books are like books about race, books about some of these other topics. This we're we're well beyond that at that point. We've we've left we've left the original mission and now we're just taking books off shelves. So yeah. Wonder wonderfully said. Thank you so much. Um Brett, you had mentioned the 1973 Supreme Court, Miller versus California. So I did pop a little bit of information just in the chat for those who uh, are joining us or join us at a later time so they can reference that. Those guidelines are as follows, just to give everyone a brief description. The average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to the pertinent interest, whether the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined by the applicable state law and whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. So to that point that Jared is making. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So to that point that Jared is making, um, definitely if we were following this ruling um, more to a T, we would see a lot less, um, I would guess, dismay and um, disgruntlement from our educators as a whole. Uh, but when we get off topic and it becomes less about um, protecting individuals and more about, I would say, um, almost policing what people are permitted to read in general, that's where those lines kind of get blurred as a whole, um, not just in the Midwest, but as we see on a more national level. Um, so I, of course, we've seen book bans historically before, um, but what do you think these bands, especially here in Missouri and Iowa, are really hoping to kind of accomplish? I think Jared kind of got to it, started hinting at it, if you wanted to expand a little bit further. I don't know if, Brett, you wanted to add to that at all, or do you, I mean... Um, I mean, I, I think the yeah, I, I think it's 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 not too cynical to say that this is a, a you know, very political. Um, I mean, this, I think the, the proponents of these bands um, are... Uh, using this to um, energize both their base and perhaps some independent voters as well. 
And I think we have to look at this in the context of the 2024 election, um, you know, we and, and kind of just writ large. Um, I think we see um, uh, on the Democratic side, there's some excitement and, and um, uh, excitement is the wrong word, but some engagement um, on the issue of, of abortion and reproductive rights. Um, and I think what on the Republican side, they're trying to find something that is is equal to that. Um, I think you have. Uh, you know, potentially two candidates at the top of the ticket. Um, if we have a, a rematch between uh, Trump and Biden, who are are both rather weak, um, uh, objectively speaking, as 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 candidates. Um, so to kind of even the playing field, um, it, it appears Republicans who support these bans um, are using them to try to you know to capitalize on this question of. Um, parental rights um, and uh, and protecting their children from being on the front lines of the culture war. Um, I think you know it, it also kind of sets the the tone for debate, right? If you can imagine a debate between a proponent of a book ban and opponent of the book ban, the proponent would say, "Well, well, my opponent supports putting pornography in front of your kids." Right. I mean, it's a really quick soundbite that, you know, can can have a big impact. And then the person on the other side says, well, I'm actually in favor of freedom of expression for and, and has to kind of explain it in, you know, um, in, in a way that takes five times as long as the, the soundbite. So um, so I mean, I think it to kind of come back to it, you know, I don't know if there's any kind of Orwellian thing going on here. Um, you know, I think it's it's um, it's concerning that there's you know, the proponents of these bans um, maybe aren't seeing how serious they are um, in uh, in terms of um, you know the the heavy hand of the state coming in and and um, affecting our freedoms of of expression. Um, but I, I think uh, this is uh, this is pure politics. Um, but um, Jared, I'm going to how are, I I'm 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 two years removed from Missouri. I don't know how things are down there. Well, I mean, I'm six months into Missouri. So, I mean, um, I, I mean, I think it's worth knowing that both Brett and I have kids. I mean, I have three kids in the public school system. And so it's not like I'm just objectively don't care what happens to children. Like I, I spent a lot of time thinking about these things. I mean, fundamentally books are filled with ideas, right? That's, I think the problem, it's not that there's certainly there are age appropriate books for different ages, but in the end, we're really talking about what ideas do, do students have access to in the libraries. And I mean, books are full of ideas. The assumption is if you can control the ideas, you can, you know, I think one of the things that is, is missed in these discussions is that um, the the books are, the, the people assume that when a, when a young person reads a book, they automatically accept those ideas, right? They read a book about, you know, gender identity and they're like, I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to do that. And that's not, I, they have not met my kids, right? Like, they have not met them. Like there's no book that I could ever hand to my children. They'd be like, Oh yeah, dad, I totally get this. They'd be like, this is stupid. <laughs> and so I think that's, it's interesting. Like sometimes it's, we should stop and think, okay, what if we expose our children to ideas and then we talk about it with them and, you know, engage with, with these ideas. Like that's sort of what books are for. So when you start banning books, you start taking away critical thinking skills, you start taking away the ability of young people to understand issues from a diversity of perspectives, which are all things that the First Amendment was created to encourage for society. And so they grow up to be adults and they aren't able to do the kind of processing. And the irony that a group would ban Orwell's books is just amazing, right? Or that they would they would ban Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. I just love that. You know, like, have you not read what they probably haven't read the book? I mean, so anyway. And uh, along with that, Jared, I think, you know, even if we can't take the Miller test and say, well, the Miller test is also going to apply to to um, to minors, the I think the key the key of of all the words of the Miller test, um, the the words as a whole, the work as a whole, I think is incredibly important. Um, so if there's like a one off, if there's like a 500 page book that has a one page sex scene you know, that that doesn't that under the Miller test, that should not disqualify the entire book. Um, and I think that should hold true as well for um, uh, for for uh, books that minors should have access to. Um, I mean, I, I think I saw a quote from uh, Jody Pico, uh, who, you know, who's a lot of her books were banned. And she said, I've never tried to titillate anyone <laughs> with my books. <laughs> 
right? That's not what I'm going for. Um, so the fact that, you know, all, that you can look at my book that might have, you know, one scene that has, um, uh, you know, a, a, a issues of, of sex or uh, sexual assault or, or gender identity in it, in, in no way is that trying. And, and I think, I mean, kids, I mean, and, and, you know, speaking from myself, I mean, I remember uh, reading a book in sixth grade, um, uh, The Flamingo Rising. Um, it was a coming of age story uh, of, um, you know, from the perspective of a young boy, right? And which is, I think, what a lot of us read back then. Um, and and sex played a role in the in the book, um, but I thought in a very uh, positive way. Um, you know, talking about issues of consent, um, about issues of of um, you know treating your partner with with dignity. I mean, that kind of stuff. I think we need to be you know that kids should have access to that. Um, you know, so not all of these are are exactly the same. Um, and I when I remember reading that book, like. I don't remember thinking like, oh, I'm reading this because I'm getting titillated. No, I'm reading it because I'm learning something um, or, or so at least selectively learning things. Right. I think I I was also, I, you know, not believing everything that I read. But yeah, yeah, I would definitely agree. I, I would say that a lot of the, the assumption is that people aren't able to at that age, especially in those schools, make the decisions for themselves to be an informed reader. And that's putting um a lot of doubt in, in the students themselves and their ability to critical think and to examine these works as a whole. Uh, of course, you know, like you said, if you can control those ideas, you're doing a lot. It's not like um, maybe this is on the extremist side, but it's not like we're trying to put playbo playboy, playboy in these public schools and in these systems. It, it's simply standard books that have been around for a really long time in some cases you know you got your 1984 that's a very good reference um that have been on the shelves for a long time and and they as a work as a whole are very representative of um, different topics in general but if they have just a little bit of information that um usually are really relative to lgbtq or gender controversies or racial controversies and those primary education systems they seem to be under attack right now um and I think it's a good point, Brett, that you made that it is um, very strange um, and unique that it is kind of being targeted, particularly right as this upcoming presidential 2024 election is coming about, um, you know, and as such, we, we're also seeing like a lot of townships are kind of trying to follow these suits on a citywide level. It's not just happening in our primary education system. I know for um, example, here in Iowa, our Pella Public Library recently just voted down changing the structure of the Board of Trustees for Pella Public Library. It was basically just kind of a grab for the Pella City Council to have authority to make those policy library changes. Um, it was very, very, very narrowly voted down. Like uh, there was not an insane margin by any means. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of any other similar cases um, that you wanted to notify our attendees of or kind of bring up in that case or particularly in Missouri, if you've seen anything of this sort. I would like to separate. I mean, I think it might be helpful to anybody who covers any of this stuff. Separate. So a school library decision and a public library decision, there's some the, the factors change. And so if the government wants to regulate what's happening in a public library, not a school library, public library, I feel like they lose that children, but the children concern. Um, and so I think that the, the standard should be much higher for them to, to censor basically books in a live in a public library because they lose the kids argument. Um, and so I want to make, oh, and I also want to mention that these, these bills have a chilling effect. So there's the, there's what the, there's what the actual bill says, which we're still kind of waiting to understand. ACLU is involved, I think, in both the Missouri and Iowa uh, laws that we're talking about here. Um, there's there's the what the bill is theoretically supposed to do, which we're not really clear on, but they want something and they're really sure of it. But um, because of librarians in, in Missouri, I was reading, I mean, a librarian could go to jail for giving the wrong book to a kid. And that's that's concerning, right? That's a, that creates a chilling effect. You're not just talking about, uh, you know, getting the books out of the library. You're talking about putting a school school district employees in jail or finding them ten like as much as they make in a year, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so that's a chilling effect, right? So what I mean by chilling effect is it causes the the bill has its original intent, but then all around it because people are afraid they over censor. Like happens all the time with laws that people over interpret the laws to just be safe. 
And the lawyers for any organization, it's their job to protect that organization to minimize risk, will advise them to over follow the law. And so you have librarians pulling hundreds of books off the shelves. Like I was reading like books about like Michelangelo's art, like the Sistine Chapel has nudity in it. Yeah, it does. But it's also <laughs> one of the great works of art in human history. Are we really going to take that off the shelves, right? So we need, we that's, a, I would say, a chilling effect pull there, right? They're just better make sure I don't want to lose my job. I don't want a parent to complain that I handed this young sixth grader who wants to study art, this great book about one of the great artists in history, and I'm going to go to jail for this. So I'm just going to take it off the shelf. And so it's, it's not just what the law does. There's like what the law says. There's like this like blast zone around it that chills speech all around it. And that's, that's particularly bad. And we're not just saying, and think about, think through this with me too. If you take the book out of the school's library, it's not saying the book isn't still available to students. It just takes it away from students who don't have any means to get ideas. And it takes books away from students who don't know how to, to make a book happen, right? Like for a lot of students, like I, I'm so privileged that I grew up in a house full of books, right? And my kids grew up in a house full of books, though they they seem to be afraid of them. They will never touch them. But like, like I could just lock a door by putting a book in front of it, and they'd be like, "Oh man, I'm not touching that." Um, like a mouse trap would be less scary than a book. <laughs> but anyway, I'd be like, you know, son, there's a book called The Mouse Trap, and they just walk away. But um, <laughs> anyway, what was where was I going? It was a great point. Where was it going? I, I think the 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 point about um, uh, disparities with resources. I oh, think yeah, that's yeah. Spot on with that. Yeah. Like, so we're not talking about like. If I was told you can't read this, the first thing I want to do is read it, right? I remember my dad told me not to read um, like Nietzsche when I was like in high school. And I was like, sure, dad. And the first thing I did is went and bought Nietzsche, right? But the, of course, I understood none of it because I was too stupid and young, but like I didn't know enough to know it, but I tried. Um, but the point is like, they just don't have that access. So you're taking away books from the people who need them the most. That was the long point there is that these bans hurt the people who need it the most, who need access to libraries the most. I 100% agree with that, um, that there is um, a question of equity here behind this. Um, you know, those of us who have the means, you know, if, if you know, if, if our daughter, my daughter's in first grade, right? And if, if somehow, you know, there was a book that she wanted that her school took away, you know, we're fortunate enough we could buy that for her um, she wanted to. And, but there, there are others who, who couldn't, who rely on that. Um, you know, I think, I think, the um Jared's absolutely right with the the um distinguish the distinction between public libraries and school libraries. Um one interesting thing from the um from the um Iowa lawsuit, the, the more recent one, not the ACLU one, but the more recent one with the book publishers, they made the argument that in some small Iowa towns, the school library functions as the de facto public library. Um and so there are adults as well who are trying to get access to some of these books who might be unable to. Um, and there's pretty clear Supreme Court precedent, like the, the Ginsburg case um, from back in the, the 1960s that said you cannot infringe upon adults' rights just for the kids. Um, you know, the, the you, you know, having a vague law that is just, well, we're trying to protect the kids is, is not sufficient. Um, and so um, that seems to be a pretty, um, you know, could be a winning strategy um, there. Um, to get to your question about have we seen other, have I seen other um, instances of this? Um, not my, I guess my radar hasn't been, uh, you know, fully tuned to, um, to uh, the, the, look what happened in Pella, um, but I'm not surprised. You know, I think it, it's important to look at this, this particular ban um, as, as kind of the, the like a trial balloon. Um, we're just going to see, Hey, let's, let's see what happens here. We'll go off, we'll go off at this soft underbelly uh, of the first amendment where precedent might be a little ambiguous. Um, and we'll say, well, we're just protecting kids uh, K through six. Um, and then let's see if we win, if, if proponents win one politically, right? So no one votes them out um, because they, they don't like the ban. And then two legally, like maybe maybe they they win these um, these lawsuits uh, against um, that are filed against them. And then it's OK, where can we go next? Like maybe next it's um, uh, it's it's high school. Maybe then it's college. Uh, you know, maybe then it, it is uh, public libraries uh, and it's kind of this creep, um, you know, from there, which is a bit different from the, the Florida model. The Florida model is just like, you know, boom, let's just knock it all down right away. Um, I think the Iowa model is a little more insidious. Um, you know, let's let's start small and then move up. 
Um, I saw uh, Elizabeth's um, uh, uh, mention in the chat. Uh, I think, you know, uh, Elizabeth is absolutely right. I think there's a, a long history um, of uh, labeling uh, anything involving LGBTQ rights, um, any, any kind of content as obscene. Uh, which is, um, you know, totally not the Miller test, um, but but yet um, that uh, that's a trope. That's a that's a trope that's been around for for decades, um, and you know we're seeing it here. Um, you look at the the at, at um, Senate File uh, four nine six. There's the 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 hardcore pornography part. But if you look at it in the context of the statute as a whole, there's restrictions on mentioning any kind of LGBTQ. Um, uh, uh, content in K through six classrooms. Um, my daughter's kindergarten class uh, teacher was a lesbian, right? So what is she supposed to do? She's not supposed to say, oh, I went home and had dinner with my wife, right? Can she not do that? Can she not talk about her own life? I mean, I think that's, um, you know, but yet a, a straight teacher could could do that. I mean, I think there's, there's a, a huge equal protection issue there. Um, but, uh, you know, there's also issues of if a student comes in and says, uh, they want to be addressed by certain pronouns. Um, all of a sudden, this law makes, um, and this kind of gets beyond the, the scope of the book banning, but this law uh, would make teachers mandatory reporters having to tell parents, some of whom may be hostile uh, to um, the um, to their child's uh, gender identity or expression, um, who you could put the child in a really unsafe situation. Um, you know, so I think there's some some real major issues there. Um, so if you look at the statute as a whole, I think absolutely. I mean, we can we can you know we can make the argument that yeah, this is just to protect kids from porn. Um, but in the in the in the whole spirit of the statute, I mean, it really is to um, to um, keep them from this kind of LGBTQ content through this this really tired trope. Yeah. Very, very well said. And I and I did um want to bring up also to Elizabeth's point. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, how are they kind of pretzeling their argument to ban anything with race content since it, it does seem like the LGBTQ is kind of the overarching um topic of most of these book bans recently and particularly in Iowa. I know Missouri has it as LGBTQ, but also some race content. Um are, are we seeing that really be the main scope or how are those kind of combined? Yeah, I saw, I mean, I didn't see, I looked through the Iowa law that we've been talking about and I didn't see anything directly related to race. So I'm trying to think how, how that happens. I mean, there are other, I mean, I know like in Texas, there's definitely curricular arguments about how they're going to frame slavery and race um, that are very uh, politically interesting. Um, so it's possible that they're, I mean, it's, we people are taking templates basically of bills and sending them around. So there's, they, they might adjust them from state to state, but it's very common for bills to, to, to look at each other's bills um, and, you know, take things out of them. So it's possible that that, but I don't, I, I was really confused about some of the things on the list that were about race. Um, I think we, it's a really good example of us needing to know these things so that we don't repeat history that we learn from our, from our history. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I also missed that in the Iowa um, statute. Um, but um, I mean, I think the the key word that is often getting used, and I think Jared's absolutely right, that I think these bills are, um, you know, look very, very similar from state to state, um, uh, even if some have a more narrow scope like Iowa's. Um, but um, the this notion of divisiveness. Uh, so a, a state might say, you cannot teach anything that is divisive. Uh, or divisive tomato tomato right so what what is that you know um if if you're gonna and i think some it's like you sh you can't make any any person of any gender or race feel shame right mm -hmm. and and there's there's a lot of problems with that where it's like well one often the intent may not be to shame anyone you know sometimes if a person feels shame or guilt or anything for for the the history of our country you know often that's on them right that's on the person who's receiving that there was no necessarily intent on the teacher who's just conveying facts um so there's that issue but in the, i think what we're seeing in a lot of these lawsuits across the country tennessee i think is one uh where the the tennessee um uh, education association filed a lawsuit um back over, over the summer really focusing on this word divisive and saying like, what does that even mean, right? That, that's that's incredibly vague. 
um, and so challenging the those those curricular laws on on vagueness grounds, um, which may be more fruitful than uh, than a First Amendment challenge. Yeah, very good. Uh, so I didn't just pop something in the chat too, but I just wanted to give everyone an opportunity um, for some information that I pulled from PEN America's recent report. In the 2022-2023 school year, they recorded 3,362 instances of books banned. That's an increase of 33% from the year prior 2021-22 school year. Their ranking shows Florida, which we mentioned, in the lead for the most significant quantities of bans, followed, of course, by Texas. We talked about Missouri. And then Utah and Pennsylvania, those round out the top five. And of course, in Missouri, it's faced a total of 333 books being banned. Um, so, of course, in each of these states, we are seeing that there is a little bit of divisiveness, as you were talking about. Not every single one of those um, states are targeting particularly only LGBTQ content. They're doing kind of a variety of different ones. The Iowa law, particularly, we are seeing mostly target the LGBTQ um, individuals. Uh, that's kind of following a lot of legislation that's been put into effect in the public school system for those pronouns, as you had mentioned previously. Um, so I did just wanna give that a moment to point that out. Um, and then kind of, I know you guys are at a college level, of course, but do you yourself um, fear kind of that this may affect you directly in your prospective careers or, you know, as, as you mentioned, Jared, you, you know that your child's educator um, is part of the LGBTQ community. Do you, do you feel for, fear for them or how are you helping um, to provide resources? Is there, is there anything that you, you can do as just a regular citizen? Well, so my, my daughter's um, teacher uh, retired. So she's like, she's like, Peace, I'm out of here, <laughs> right? Um, uh, and I remember like her last year, um, you know, like she like every month she'd wear a shirt that said like don't legislate hate, right? And um, you know, and, and was like, I don't care what they're gonna do, fire me, right? Like, I'm out of here. Um, so it was kind of cool to see. And, you know, and of course my daughter had questions and we told her, like, yeah, this is what's going on. And, you know, and and for being a kindergartner, she really had a lot of empathy, right? Here's someone who she looks up to, right? A a, a really beloved teacher who had been a pillar in the community for over 30 years. Um, and uh, and you know, so like of course you know like it is an incredible injustice um to her so um so i'm i'm actually um funny story she actually came to substitute yesterday for my daughter's first grade class um you know come out of retirement to substitute my daughter was so happy right she's like miss carla's here uh, i probably shouldn't use her name for privacy <laughs> reasons but anyway um uh well i um uh I mean, here at the college level, we're already, and I'm not sure how it is uh, down at, with the, the Board of uh, Curators in Mizzou, at Missouri, um, but our Board of Regents here in Iowa um, recently have, um, have made um, policy decisions restricting how we can, um, not how we can teach, but how uh, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, are considered in in things um like hiring uh or, or things like that um uh we already had the decision from the supreme court uh, in the harvard admissions case um from from uh, last term um that now makes it much more difficult uh for schools to to recruit uh you know uh, a a diverse uh, student body where you know, we all of a sudden have a uh, a as as um, Justice Brennan put it, a mul multitude of tongues, right? We can learn from a multitude of tongues. It's much much harder to deal with that to to do that now. Um, so if if we're not necessarily seeing book bannings here, um, we are seeing some pushback on uh, on the same issues. Um, and uh, we uh, the University of Iowa's School of Journalism just recently went through accreditation um, and. Uh, you know, we we passed, uh, which is, I think, public knowledge, which is really awesome. Um, but one of the things that, you know, we really uh, had uh, to work to argue vociferously was, you know, what we're doing when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is one of the uh, one of the key um, elements of, of getting reaccredited, despite what the state is doing, despite what the Supreme Court is doing. Um, uh, so, and, and that's not a position you, you want to celebrate that stuff. You don't want, you don't want to say that, you know, you're doing this, um, in some kind of like clandestine way, um, you know, it feels kind of, kind of dirty. So, um, Jared, how are things, how are things in, at, at, 
at Mizzou? I mean, I don't know of any policies, but I think, you know, it, it, we've talked about how this is kind of a culture war thing, right? The people will co coalesce around an issue and it becomes illogical. Like the original argument a lot of times is there's something to it. There's always a grain of something that is important to it, but then it kind of gets off the rails when everybody just gets really emotional about it. And suddenly we're pulling all kinds of the Bible and Mike, Michelangelo and everything off the shelves. And so, I mean, the last thing you want is to be teaching an undergraduate class and to assign a reading that one student posts on social media, you know, oh my gosh, my liberal professor is making us read this liberal communist socialist just throw whatever keywords are going to trigger the most people out and so i mean i think there's no one telling standing over my shoulder saying you can't assign that reading but you think about it when you're building the class like is this worth it like is this reading worth it um I'm, maybe i don't get fired but it's just going to be a giant pain in the ass do i want to deal with this or do i want to just maybe we'll save this for the grad class where they're a little more ready to hear it so that I would say that's the chilling effect though, right? There's no law, but there's this chilling fear that if I trigger the wrong people, if any academic, and, and I mean, there's a lot of people on campuses all around the country who are more vulnerable than I am, um, who are in year to year contracts or are trying to get tenure, who are in a lot more dangerous position than I am. And so it's much more concerning for them and they're much more likely to censor just out of fear um, about that. So it could affect what the students are encountering in their classes. They may never know that because they don't know to know because they, they rely on us to know what they should be reading. But if we don't tell them, they don't know and they don't engage with these important readings. Yeah, wonderful. Wonder wonderfully well said. Uh, moving back, that, that that does kind of prompt the uh, good question for uh, me and for audience members who may join us at a, at a later time or view this webinar at a later time. Um, we know, of course, like 1984, there's there's a laundry list of books, but what are some of the titles that you particularly are seeing affected and why do you think they might be being targeted? You know, you mentioned that there's some that you might kind of move away from, particularly as an educator yourself, just to avoid maybe some additional controversy and um, uh, other educators might be avoiding altogether to avoid, you know, retribution from their university or from their um you know, school staff or board of education and uh, Iowa Department of Education, you know, they're getting involved in a lawsuit right now, but um, to check against Senate file 496 to clarify, but, you know, not every state has that same kind of support where they have these educational constructs who are going to back for them, but are instead maybe kind of supporting what, you know, the governing bodies are passing down. So are there any particular ones that you wanted to kind of point out that are being targeted that you're seeing maybe on a national level or just in your state that kind of maybe surprise or awe you? I think there are certain uh, books. Go ahead. Right, go ahead. I would say like the, the color purple, right? Um, uh, I, I know why the cage bird sings. Um, I mean, those are, you know, uh, treasures of literature. Um, and, you know, I think the the issues of racism um that are prevalent in those in those books um the the issue of sexual assault um mm -hmm. you know that those are important things that we need to grapple with now um i, I mean maybe some sixth graders uh who are at an advanced reading level could read that um you know i think by the time you're in sixth grade you know yeah you should be you're you're you are uh, your identity is changing, your body is changing. You need to know this this kind of stuff, right? And so I think that's that's um, unfortunate. Uh, Forrest Gump, I thought that was, that was one that I read. I think I was in seventh grade, so I would have been beyond the um, the um, uh, the the uh, kindergarten to sixth grade when I read that. Um, I think I read it right after the movie came out, uh, and it, it was awesome. I mean, it, it's very. I I read it because it was everyone said it's so different from the movie. Um, it's written uh, in, um, you know, it's, it's told from the first person from Forrest Gump's perspective um, and in kind of his language, um, his his cadence of speech deals with racism. Yeah, there, there was a sex scene in it, but like I didn't pick the book up to be titillated. I picked it up because like I heard it was really, really good. You know, so I, I was surprised that that was in there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not familiar with a lot of the kids books that, you know, um, have things in them about, you um, gender identity or things like that um you know uh, so um i i'm i guess 
from a broad level, I'm not surprised that those are in there. Uh, I think it's it's unfortunate that they are, but um, none of them really st stuck out st stood out because I I don't know them. Um, I'm not super familiar with that world. Yeah, any of the um, of course the Mayan Angelou is just I'm just like that's I just yeah that's like a trigger one for me. But like uh, I would just add the Toni Morrison works. Um, but again, like he said, like Brett said, I mean. It seems like if there's a sexual assault in a book that they don't like, that they ideologically don't like, they will use that. And I mean, if it is dealt in a, in a, a I don't know how to say it, but in a way that is like, it's good for students to be aware that these things happen and that there are, you know, these are not appropriate behaviors and these sorts of things. If they read it in books, it's a good way to learn about these things. Um, I would hate for things to be banned because of that. And I think that's what's happening with, because I look at the book and I'm like, why? And I'm like, oh, there's that one, one scene, that one thing. And that that's just enough uh, to get it on the list. But if you look at the, the books, I mean, there are a lot of consistency. There's probably 10 books that are like consistently across all the states, uh, the most banned books. And they're mostly gender, gender related books. Like Brett said, newer ones that I didn't encounter in my and reading in that age group time, I was in the reading rainbow with LeVar Burton age group, which we didn't, yes. <laughs> you know, I was, I was, I remember like seeing it on PBS and literally like getting on my bike and riding to the library to go get that book. You know, I mean, that was, was LeVar Burton. He said to read it. What do you do? You read the book, right? So he was Jordy, right? He had to, yeah. Well, he wasn't yet. This is before it was cool to be LeVar Burton. I mean, yeah. other than for him. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We're, we're definitely seeing a lot of those same titles, not just in uh, Iowa and Missouri, but we're seeing those kind of pop up country, countrywide, uh, especially. Um, um, I did want to kind of move to a broader scope of a question. Of course, we know that there's an ongoing lawsuit with ACLU, both in Iowa as well as in Missouri, but we are seeing some publishers also get involved here in Iowa. Penguin Random Publishing House and the Iowa Department of Education also just stepped up to bring a lawsuit against the governmental bod uh, body like Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds. Um, this is kind of a broad scope question, but I, we don't really know what the outcome is going to be. But is there any kind of case law that you guys have seen or um, any kind of guidance that we can just kind of offer these parents and individuals who are invested in the outcome in this? Would, do we see this going well? Uh, will only time tell? What do we think? So Brett mentioned the PICO decision, which is the most direct hit to this of all of our, of all Supreme Court cases. I can't think of another book related to free speech in schools case like this. And so I want, I thought we could mention that one. And I mean, it's interesting because this, this case happened in the seven, well, it's, it started in the seventies in New York. And so, I mean, it was decided in the eighties, but it's not the clearest decision it's not like the best. I don't teach it. I don't know, Brett, do you teach it in your class, your undergraduate class? I don't teach it either. No, and I, think, I mean, it, yeah, I, th I, think, I think I want to now. <laughs> I know. I was like, should I? I think it's been in there before. It's like come and gone over the years, um, but it's not part of the canon of, of First Amendment communication law class cases. In the end, the Supreme Court, I think if I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Brett, like, they said that in the case, the school library had removed several titles. This is very exactly what we're talking about, like 50 years ago. The school library had reserved because of, you know, pressure from a group had removed several titles and a parents group contested this removal from the school library. And um, it, there were steps along the way. In fact, they, they created a board. The school board created a separate group to evaluate the titles. And the, and the group said, hey, let's not ban all these. Just these four are the problem but they ignored them and just banned all of them anyway. And so uh, the Supreme Court ultimately said for kind of a nuanced thing, and I think that's why it makes it harder to teach this case. They said schools, once they have a book on the shelves, they can't, rem and, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Brett here, they can't remove the book because of the ideas in the book. So school librarians and any librarian has always exercised judgment in the decision, like in what books to bring into the collection. They are professionals, librarians. They are very good at what they do. I. I, I mean, I'm so thankful for so many librarians. Um, and I, was, I love having an office in a library. It's actually really wonderful. And, um, but anyway, they're, they, they have their professional opinion about what their audience needs. And what this, these laws do is kind of take, take the librarians a little, takes the power out of their hands. But anyway, in the case, the court said, 
once the book is in the collection, it would be censorship. It would be government censorship kind of to take the book out of the collection because the ideas. But the library has library and the school board is likely, is free to set rules about future book acquisitions. And there's a quote that's really, there's a really good quote here. This is like the money quote. If like if I was teaching, I'd call it money quote. The main quote, most important thing. Petitioners rightly possess significant discretion to determine the content of their school libraries, but that discretion may not be exercised in a narrowly partisan or political manner. Our constitution does not permit the official suppression of ideas. Thus, whether petitioners removal of books from the school libraries denied respondents their First Amendment rights depends upon the motivation behind the actions. So this, I'm not done with the quote, even though you want it me to be, I'm not. So <laughs> like, but I'm pausing here to say, this is when we talk about the cases, which was your original question, how they're gonna go. Theoretically, the judges are gonna come back and read this case. And this quote should tell us a lot about how it should go. So the last hat, last third is, um, let's see, da -da -da. okay. Local school boards may not remove books from school libraries simply because they dislike the ideas contained in those books um, and, and seek by their removal to prescribe what shall be orthodox politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion. So I feel like that's, that's what we should be looking at, but I'm waving a piece of paper at you because it's 551 in my day is that's where we are in the day. But like, that's, that's what, and it, you, when I read that quote, I get kind of upset because I'm like, these laws are living in a universe where they have not read this. Mm -hmm. And so I would tell all these lawmakers, like, if you want to achieve a goal, I want to hear what your goal is. And then I want to sit down and I want to read this case with you and say, okay, now how do we reach your goal without breaking the first amendment here? Like, how do we do that? Okay, go ahead, Brad, sorry. Well, I was, I, 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 I have the excellent, I, I think you, you, you nailed Pico. Um, I, I think I might push back and say, my guess is they have read the case and they're thinking this is this is vulnerable. Um, mm -hmm. It's a plurality opinion written by, you know, hippie pinko kami Justice Brennan, <laughs> right? <laughs> But also the most important First Amendment, like one of the three most important justices for the First Amendment. Absolutely right. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a he wrote a, the he he wrote the Miller test, didn't he? Or no, hold on. Was that no that was he it wrote was, the it one was before Berger. he wrote the Roth test. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, you know, you have a Supreme Court, you know, who knows <laughs> if it, how far this case would go. I think we, we, there's a lot of legal entrepreneurialism going on right now. Um and uh, you know who knows if this would get to the Supreme Court, but you have a Supreme Court who is, you know, um, like, you know, I think there's there's a podcast that has a T-shirt that says "Starry Decisis is for suckers," right? <laughs> so, um, you know, you you have that issue. Um, the other thing about Pico is it didn't involve, to my knowledge, and I might be wrong about this, it didn't involve um, books with sexual content. It had stuff that was like anti-American or un-American content um, uh, that the, the board was focusing on. And so it, it appears that what the, uh, and maybe I'm giving the state too much credit here, but what they appear to be doing is kind of shoehorning or Trojan horsing this, this obscenity for kids argument uh, as, a, as a poison pill to go after uh, Pico, which I, Jared's absolutely right. I mean, this is the case and this, this, you know, the, 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 um, the complaint um, uh, that uh, the, the publishers filed, you know, Pico's all over it. Um, you know, but I I think the the um, there's enough facts that could be with the the sexual uh, content issue um, and uh, the fact that you know it might be a vulnerable precedent um, you know could lead it to um, uh, to not holding. But I mean, there's other I think what what the other stuff you have in there, um, and I think this is you know the the good lawyering that the the um, uh, the publishers have done is they've shown, well, yeah, we have, look at Tinker, you know, Tinker uh, that says, you know, in dicta, you know, students have first amendment rights. We know they don't share their, their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. Um, you know, you apply that with Pico. Pico says, um, you know, the, the, the special characteristics of the school library make that environment especially appropriate for the recognition of first amendment rights. So you connect those two cases, you take Pico and, and anchor it to a really, really strong precedent. You anchor it to the 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 Ginsburg case that says you can't restrict the speech of adults just to protect kids, and so you have those you know small schools that have that the the school library is the public library like that that can be um, you know a a, a strong um, you know way to kind of fortify and buttress uh, the Pico decision, um, but uh, but no I I think that um, 
you know, that and, you know, maybe this uh, could be a way to finally, you know, give us a standard for um, what, uh, um, what obscenity for kids is. I mean, I, th I think the other kind of issue here, I mean, maybe if, if the First Amendment issue, you know, if we don't squarely address that, we could look at the vagueness issue. What is age appropriate? I mean, that's all over the 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 um, the statute as well, or the 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 complaint as well. You know, age appropriate is is kind of like divisive. How do we know what it is? Um, it creates a chilling effect. Um, you know, if we don't know what the boundaries are, we're going to err on the side of chilling speech, um, and and we don't want to do that. Um, so uh, you know, maybe maybe the the most success would be you know focusing on the vagueness of the law rather than the constitutional challenge or the, the the first amendment challenge but they don't have to the key is the laws don't okay the laws to the people who do are doing who are creating the laws the laws don't even have to be constitutional they've already succeeded on several levels by just creating a law like this one red meat for the base they've, they've, they've inflamed the base they've gotten their talking points for the next election cycle and the donors two they've already gotten libraries up books off the shelves they don't have to create a constitutional law to get 100, 350 law books off the library shelves in Missouri in the last year. Um, so you, so even if you're just like, I don't care what the constitution says, I don't want to care what the Supreme Court says, I just want these books out of these libraries, they've already succeeded in, in making significant headway in there and they've made librarians afraid. And I mean, I meant to mention this earlier, but like, no wonder we have teaching shortages all over the country, yeah. you know, I mean, my neighbor in Texas was a, was a teacher, was my actually taught my all three of my sons at one point or another when they were in elementary school. She's managing a restaurant. She's done with this crap. She's done. She's not going to put up with this anymore. And so uh, it's harder and harder to find teachers when they become political, um, just victims of, of political things. Um, and the last thing about this was there's a political big picture to all these laws too, because it they connect to other laws um, all over the all over the country that are doing different things than book bans, but they're also all related to controlling which ideas we see. The Supreme Court is hearing five First Amendment related cases about social media right now. This term, just this term, five about one thing. If they were going to hear five First Amendment cases about all different things, that would be a lot for one term. Five all about social media and government control of social media, and then you know two of them, the Texas and Florida cases you know, are about whether or not the government can force a, a social media company to publish and keep up and keep speakers up that would otherwise be taken down. Um, it's all about ideas. It's all about controlling ideas in the space for discourse. They're all related in that way. Well said. Yeah, thank you for uh, bringing that point up that, that there are a lot of ongoing legislation related just to the First Amendment in general, not just to the book bans, but it's just in general to the censorship. You know, censorship doesn't just happen to average citizens and just the media. You know, of course, you know, we get cease and desist as journalists all the time, but it's, it's not just us that are under attack. We're talking average everyday citizens and educators who are fear and just in absolute fear of uh, going into the public education system or returning to the system of teaching because they may be stripped of their licensing down the road. That's a serious concern. Um, I did want to point out something that Elizabeth Donald um, tossed in there, maybe a little bit of hopeful note before we uh, pass up this uh, opportunity. Illinois has passed a law effective in 2024 that is going to strip state fund state strip state funding from public libraries that ban books. So that was a wonderful thing to hear and I'm excellent that that you shared that with us. Thank you. Um, and then kind of uh, back to that note that I was just making about the journalists and average citizens. Um, is there anything that we can do as just to help fight the censorship? What would you recommend? I, I yes, and I, the the answer for for Iowa um, Iowa journalists is, is especially um, Iowa high school journalists. Iowa has a really really strong new voices law. Um, so, you know, there's the Hazelwood case, um, the, from the, from, um, the, the eighties that said there's no first amendment right that students have, uh, against their principal in a public school that they'll like pre-review copy and take mm -hmm. it out if they, they think it's, it's, um, you know, too sensitive or for whatever other reason, um, states then went and passed a whole bunch of these, 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 um, new voices laws. Iowa was one of the first. Um, in, the, in the few years right after Hazelwood. Um, so students here in Iowa, high school journalism students, like this should be your beat. 
Um, I mean, go report on this. Um, you have this statutory protection behind you. Um, you know, make make this your your story. What what's happening in your school district? What books are being banned? Um, you know, your principal can't touch you. Um, so um, so yeah, I would say that group of journalists um, would be um, uh, should be should be on this uh, hardcore. Missouri has no such new voices legislation. They've tried. They've tried so hard. I know. I've, I've already been in contact with people trying to help. And I just for fun, I had a dinner with Kathy Kuhlmeyer and John Tinker last month. Oh, cool. So I met Mary Beth and John Tinker now and and Kathy Kuhlmeyer. She's going to come talk to my class. But anyway, so it was just so cool. Um, things that they can do. I think like one of the things that we've I've tried to do during this, I think we've both done during this webinar is try to add some nuance to these laws into the bands and try to like section off. So when journalists, student journalists or regular journalists, student journalists are regular journalists. But anyway, um, when they are reporting about these bands, be nuanced in your reporting. The um a lot of the discourse uh from the people wanting these bands is often very nonsensical and it's it's not well grounded. And so providing your audience, like, of course, give them their opportunity to speak. They deserve this, you know, that's part of the, the, the reporting work, but provide nuance to your audience, help them explain these are different if it's a school or if it's a public library, you know, it's different. These are, you know, and, and call sources that can help you um, call all different sources around the country that would be give you context to help you report more accurately about these things. Yeah, wonderful. Very well said. I think it's very important that we kind of take it into our own hands, you know, act um, as a, a leader yourself, even if you are just, as you mentioned, uh, a high school student, you, you have a lot of power in, in certain states, of course, you have a lot of power to uh, be able to speak to your congressional leaders and to pose these questions and to write into your uh, individuals in those governmental bodies and offices uh, locally at your own level um, to say, why you oppose this and why it may be, you know, very harmful in the long run and, and why it's a very decisive um, and maybe negative effect, as you said, chilling effect on individuals everywhere. Um, I did just want to ask if there's anything that I forgot um, to ask during our conversation today, would you like to add that? The floor is yours. I had wanted to make sure we talked about Pico, but we did. Right? Was there anything that you're thinking about? Um, I'm looking through my notes. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, I think I think there's an issue here. You know, and, and Jared, you know, you can talk a little bit about you know your experience as well. I mean, I think I think you did right with with. Um, you know, issues you might have with, uh, if a student questions the the readings you give. I mean, sometimes when when we teach the First Amendment, we teach really hard cases, right? Cases where um, extremist organizations uh, have have had their rights vindicated. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, a case like um, REV versus St. Paul, where the Supreme Court struck down an ordinance that was trying to ban hate speech uh, in the city of St. Paul, saying no, that was viewpoint discrimination. I teach that case, and you know, I get students who are like, like wow, like how awful it is that you're, you know, that there's, that you have a system that protects like the worst of the worst uh, speakers out there. I, I, yeah, that is one way to look at it. I think, you know, another way to look at it is, you know, if we go to, too far down this free speech for me and not for the path, I, I think we start, you know, seeing uh, that happen from the other side. So I think, you know, you get um, you, if you have a lot of these proponents of, of book bans saying like, oh, um, you know, we uh, we are being uh, our our views are being censored. Um, you know, we have these these woke ideas being thrust down our throats. Um, you know, OK, we're going to silence you. We're going to silence um, silence these woke ideas um, it, all of a sudden. Right. The the shoes on the other foot. Um, so, I mean, I think this, it, it becomes really, really important for students to, you know, and this gets to what Jared said about nuance. I like, really appreciate the nuance in, in First Amendment um, uh, First Amendment decisions. I mean, yeah, it can be really hard 
to learn about these neutral principles and and defend the rights of neo Nazis. I mean, yeah, that's that's awful to think about from a moral perspective. Uh, but from a legal perspective, you know, this is why we have the First Amendment um, to protect uh, ideas that, you know, are arguably much more socially beneficial um, from from these kinds of, of attacks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that addition. Very, very good point. Um, some great sound bites there. Uh, free speech for me and now for they we love to hear it. Um, did you have anything? I, else did, I didn't come up with that. I, I stole yeah. that one. <laughs> <laughs> Was there anything else you would like to add, Jared? I think I think that that's a good way to end. Really, that's a great okay. way to end. Wonderful. Well, we are at, at that hour point, so I did just want to. I popped it in the chat as well. But if there are any additional questions that our attendees or future attendees that seeing this webinar recorded have, is there a good way that they can get in contact with either of you? They could just email. Is my email address in there somewhere? Or I can pop it in. You got it. Okay. Yep, I'll get it in there. Um, and is Brett, would you care if I share your email as well with our audience? Members? Absolutely. Happy, happy to share. Yeah. Uh Brett dash DJ dash Johnson. Uh Johnson is such a cursed name, right? There's so many, so many out there. Um, but Brett dash G dash Johnson at UI at EDU. Okay, perfect. So getting those in the chat right there for you right now. So there's first one for you. And here you Jared, are. you so had to have again. your middle initial on yours. Uh, I, 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 they let me customize mine. To oh, they did. Okay, mine. that's cool. So I, I did the same one I had my previous institution, just with a different ending, so it would be easy to tell people. Nice. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much for your time. We really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to to lead this webinar and to inform our public, especially about what's going on here in the Midwest. It was very informational and very educational. I think this was an excellent talk and I really appreciate your time. I'm going to go ahead and stop that recording now, okay?